this computer. I'm going to try and do a second. Oh, okay. Um, so systems of equations. Previously, we've all been trying to solve one variable at a time because we've said you can't have two variables in an equation because you can't solve for two at the same time until you have systems of equations, which involves two equations so that if you have two variables and two equations you can find solutions to both of those values and what we're looking for is the one pairing of x and y values as an ordered pair that makes both equations true it can't just be true for one equation it has to be true for both so that if we were even graphing this and we have one line crossing this way and another line crossing this way, the point where those two lines intersect would be the solution to this system because it is a point that is true on this linear equation and a point that is true on this linear equation. And this is the only combination that is true for both. So we would find the X value and its corresponding Y and that would be our solution. But in order to do this, we need to be setting up two different systems or two different equations. And we have three different ways to solve for them. We can solve them using the graphing method. We can solve them using the substitution method and also the elimination method. And depending on the complexity of the story problem or the set of equations that you're given, each different style has its own benefit or drawback. So it's really about you figuring out what's gonna work best for you based on the context of the situation and rolling with that. And then if some point you prefer just one method, like you've really got it down and you want to use that for all of your forms of solving, that's a okay. You're not going to be graded on the method that you choose. You're going to be graded on your solution. So to start with um, what unit you on? We're this is the fourth unit. Okay. Uh so when we're given a story problem, we need to convert these unknowns into two different equations. Generally, one is a quantity equation and one is a cost equation. And again, we're using two variables, generally just X and Y, okay? So let's say Mother's Day ranks fourth in spending in the United States behind winter holidays, back to school buying and Valentine's Day. About, you know, $15.8 billion is spent altogether. Um, on Mother's Day. And so of this total amount, $5 billion was spent on meals and flowers. Okay. And but there was about a billion more spent on meals than flowers. How much was spent on each? Well, it might seem like, well, I don't know, there's not enough information, but there is. So the first stop, the first part is to define what don't we know. Okay, it's talking about the money spent on meals and flowers. So we just choose one, X equals money spent on meals, and Y is gonna be money spent on flowers. Since these are my two unknowns, I define them. And then I can start plugging them into equations based on the clues that I'm given, all right? It says that a total of 5 billion was spent on meals and flowers. So that means the how much was spent on meals plus how much was spent on flowers gives me, oop, not 20, it's five. Gives me, Five billion. And because it's in terms of billions, I don't need all those zeros. I just need a five. Okay. So there's one equation, but this alone, this could be any combination of things one and four, two and three, zero and five. You're switching it up. We don't know. But the second set of information gives us some more clues. We know that one billion more was spent on uh, restaurants than flowers. So that means that the amount that restaurants value is the amount I spent on flowers plus an additional 1 billion. I now have two different systems or two different equations that I can use to find out, well, what is the one pairing of X and Y values that make both of these true? We have two options. We could use the graphing method or the substitution method. 
I want to show you the graphing method. We've just finished dealing with linear equations, where when we have an equation written in slope-intercept form, we can graph it because we know it's y-intercept and where we go from there. So if I rewrite this top equation in slope-intercept form, I would take the x away. So that would leave me with y equals negative x plus 5. If I graph that, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I'm starting up here, and where am I going from there? I'm going down one, forward one, down one, forward one, down one, forward one, down one, forward one, down one, forward one. So there's that line, okay? If I then also rewrite this in slope-intercept form, if I take away the one, I have y equals x minus one. So that would be saying, I start at negative one, and I go up one, over one, up one, over one, up one, over one. Well, look at that. My lines cross right here. Well, what is the value of this? I am one, two, three for the X and one, two, up two for the Y. So this is saying that my solution would be X is three, Y is two. Let's make sure that that works. If I have three plus two, is it five? Yes. If, do I have three? Does three equal two plus one? Yes. So that means three and two is my solution. So in order to use the graphing method, it can be great. It can be really nice when your equations are in nice, easy to make slope intercept Four. So if we can convert it easily, it's easy to graph. It has a nice, simple whole number. The graphing method can be really easy and simple. Sometimes it's not always clear cut. So we want to be able to make sure we have another option, and that is the substitution method. Okay, so we go back to this original system. Well, this in this case, I have X isolated, and it says that it is worth Y plus one. So I know what X is worth in terms of Y's value. Well, what would I do if X equaled three? If I had solved this and I have an X equals three, well, what do we do with that three? We plug it in for X and solve. Okay, well, I don't have a three, but I have a Y plus one. So what we do is we take X's value y plus one, and we substitute it in for the x value in the other equation. So now instead of having an x, I have a y plus one here plus y equaling five. By substituting what x is worth, by using the y variable, I have been able to get rid of my x which then lets me have just one variable that I'm trying to solve for. We know how to solve for one variable. We combine like terms. So if I have a Y and Y, I have two Y plus one equaling five. And then to start solving for Y, I get rid of the term that is sharing that side with the Y. So I have two Y now equals four. And then my final step is to divide the two off of both sides, leaving me with y equals two. Okay, and now I know what y is worth. So if I come back here, plug it in here, that's gonna tell me what x is worth. So if I have two plus one, it's gonna be three, right? Two plus one. So x is three. So as we write our answers in systems, Using the order pair method, just as usual, it's cleaner than writing x equals this, y equals this. If we just write it as an ordered pair, we know the first term is x, the second term is y. And then once we get those again, it's you should always double check. We know that two and three work in one equation, but that doesn't necessarily mean it works in the second. So we have to prove it that it's true in both. So then if I plug in a three, Add a two, does that equal five? Yes, so three and two is our solution. So the graphing method, as I showed, was really nice when you just have a simple equation, but there's also other information that you can find by rewriting your equations in slope-intercept form, because sometimes you will come across a situation where there is no solution. 
There's no possible pairing of X and Y values that is going to work for both equations. Uh, there's also times where, guess what? Anything works. And we can find that out through the linear, uh, the, the linear form, the, the slope intercept form. So when I rewrite this one here, to get the y by itself, I need to add 2x to each side so that I have y equals 2x plus 1. So I moved that, I added 2x to each side so that y is by itself. Here, I need to take 3x away from each side. So I have y equals negative 3x plus 1. Now, if we think of this in terms of linear functions, we know that the number in front of the x is our slope, and the number by itself, the constant, is our y-intercept. These happen to have the exact same y-intercept. So guess what our solution is? It's 0 and 1, because we know they both cross through the y-intercept, or the y-axis, at the same spot. But in this form, I also know that there's a solution because in order to have a solution to my system, I just have to have different slopes. I know that there is a solution to this because my lines are moving at different rates. As long as I know they're moving at different rates, they will cross at some point, which means there is a solution to the system. So I know that there is one solution. Actually, let me move this over here. So I know that there is one solution as long as I have different slopes. And this question is asked on the test. So we do want to be aware of what conditions need to be met to know whether it's even worth spending our time trying to solve it or if there's no possible solution or everything is the solution. So it can save us some time. If I go over here, you might notice y plus 2, but look at this. The same on this side is equaling something different on the right side. If I went ahead and rewrote it in slope-intercept form, I take the 2x away from each side, so y equals negative 2x plus 3, and y equals negative 2x minus 4. They have the same slope but different y-intercepts. This means there is no solution because with the same slope, it means my lines are moving at the exact same rate, but never crossing because they move at the same rate, but they cross the y-axis at different points. So they're going to continue to move parallel to one another, never crossing. So there is no solution if these two conditions are met, same slope, but different by intercepts, okay? And then if this had been where Maybe we have 2y, 4x, and uh, 6. Where when I rewrote this and I moved the, the 4 over, so I have a y, 2y equals negative 4x plus 6. And then I divided the 2 off of everything. That'd be y equals negative 2x plus 3. Oh, wait. That is the exact same value. So we know that anything I plug in for x and y, are, it's the exact same line. If you graphed it, it would be one line representing two different equations. So we know there are infinite solutions when two conditions are met, and that would be same slope, but you would also need to have same Y intercept. Okay? So sometimes you're just going to be asked, can is this is there a solution to this? Yes or no? And when in rewriting it, you'd be able to determine that. Now things are a little messier and not quite clear-cut numbers. Graphing methods, not always very efficient. 
So we want to use an algebraic method. One of those methods is the substitution method. So it is all about replacing one variable with its value in terms of the other one, okay? So if I have a two, zoom this in, two y plus x equals one and y minus two x equals eight, okay? So in situations like this, it's easy to solve when you have a variable by itself, okay? I have a variable without a number on it here. I have a variable without a number on it here. So what I wanna do is I wanna get one of these alone. It doesn't matter which one. In this case, because I have this negative two X, this jumps out at me as the one, two. If I move it over, it gets to turn positive. So I'm gonna rewrite this. So I have Y equals, add two X to each side, two X plus eight. So now this one is gone. So I now know what Y's value is in terms of X's value. So what I can do is I'm going to take what Y is worth and plug that in for the Y in my second equation. So now I have two times Y's value. Well, Y is worth two X plus eight. And then I also had another X and all of this is supposed to equal one. Now I only have one variable to solve for. I can solve for one. I can't solve when both of the variables still exist within the equation. Okay. So I distribute my two to the two X to now have four X. I distribute the two to the eight to now get 16. And then I have an X and it equals one. I then see I have X in two different places. I can't solve what is in two different places. So I combine like terms to give myself five X plus 16 equaling one. I need to get the X term by itself. So that means I have to get rid of 16, get rid of 16, leaving me with five X. And I have one, I owe 16, it means I still owe 15. So I have a negative 15. Then when I divide five off of both sides, that leaves me with X equals negative three because I had a negative divided by a positive. Now that I know what X is worth, I wanna plug it in here to find out, to, so that I can get a number on this side and that tells me what then Y is worth. So if I plug in Y equals two times X's value, which we've established is negative three, and then I'm supposed to add eight to that. Two times negative three is gonna be negative six plus eight. My terms are different, my signs are different, so I find the difference which is a positive two. So Y equals two, X is negative three, according to what I've done. We know that works for this equation, or even if we plugged it back into the original, it doesn't matter, it's all the same values, just read in different order. Um, the real test is, does it work in the other equation, one of my original two. So I plug in y's value, which I see is two. So if I have two times two plus x's value, which is negative three, does it equal one? Okay, two times two is four minus three, and it does equal one. So yes, this is a solution to my system because this XY pairing works in both equations. So we looked at this system earlier and we were able to realize there is no solution to this because while the left side is the same, the right side is different. There's no way I can make the two sides then be equal, okay? Let's prove this mathematically again. We have to, in the substitution method, we have to get one variable by itself and then have all the other terms, values on the other side to say what that one isolated variable is worth in terms of that second 
variable. So I'm just gonna grab this one just because it's on the bottom, it's easier to, to move around. And I'm gonna go ahead and isolate the Y here. So that means I have to subtract two X from both sides so that I have Y equals negative two X minus four. Now, and you don't have to have the two X go first. I'm just keeping it in slope intercept form. It doesn't matter. You can have the negative four come first and the negative two X, it's all good. All right, so now I know what Y is worth. I'm going to cross this out just so I don't get distracted by it because we've, we've changed this into this. So this is kind of out of the running. I'm now going to say, well, what is Y worth? It is worth this much. So I'm going to plug it in to Y's place. I'm going to substitute it. Y is now worth negative 2X minus 4 plus 2X, and it's supposed to equal 3. Well, I have an X term here and an X term here. I have to combine like terms. If I have a negative 2X and a positive 2X, guess what? That's zero. So that leaves me with a negative four on one side and a positive three on the other. All of my other variables have been canceled out. So guess what? They don't equal, so there's no solution because when my variables have canceled out and the constants left behind are different, it means there's no solution to this. Whenever we're given story problems, one of the challenges is to then convert the story problem into usable equations. And for systems, we have to make sure we're using two equations. So when we're given a story problem, like in the printing posters, and it's saying Elliot is promoting a concert and he needs to print all these posters to post around town so he can get a lot of people to come. Uh, and he gets information from two different companies. And so we have company one, which is A plus printing. And then we have the second company, which is print more. Okay. And the, he, he's told that, oh, for A plus printing, we have a setup fee, no matter how many copies you spend, you uh, have to have a $20 setup fee and then 10 cents per copy after that. Okay. So, we have it, and so we have to kind of figure out well, what are the two things that we don't know? One, we don't know how many copies Elliot needs. So we can't exactly tell him, oh, it's gonna cost you this much for this many copies. We don't really know. What we're trying to find out because these two different places have different rates, at which point, is one place better than the other? So we're more, rather than trying to solve it, we're trying to advise Elliot. And so to set this up, our two unknowns are the cost, what it's gonna to cost to print these, and how many copies we have to make. So we do wanna def define those um, of X is being the number of copies and Y being the cost, okay? Because back to our linear functions, the number of copies that we make then controls how much we get charged, right? So it is our independent variable. So generally we should keep that as the X to just keep it more familiar. And that the end result is then the cost. So that's our Y equals, okay? So we know our cost for A plus is we have a fixed price, $20. It is a constant, okay? Flat fee, no matter what. Then what happens in addition to that? Well, I get charged 10 cents for every copy I make, but I don't know how many copies. So how would I figure out how much I owe for one copy, for 10 copies, for 50 copies? I multiply the cost times the number of copies I'm making. But again, I don't know what it is, so we got to use X. One of the things to be aware of, this is 10 cents. If I don't have a decimal on here, I'm saying it costs me $10 per copy to go with the $20 setup fee. Because I already have a large value here, I need to make sure that I'm including the decimal to show that this is a much smaller value. So here's my equation that would let me calculate the cost for A+. plus. Then I have print more over here. Well, it's saying it has a, again, the cost, I'm gonna set it up the same, is determined by a $55 startup fee and then five cents per copy. Again, we have to express 
the money in terms of what five cents looks like as a decimal. Five cents is not a whole number. It has to be in its decimal form so that we're accurately calculating the money. Y equals, Y equals, these both say Y, and what they equal, that means these equal each other. So if we did the substitution method, we grab what Y is worth, and we plug it in for y in the other equation. So that leaves us with 55 plus 0 0.05x equals 20 plus 0 0.10x. What this means is we're trying to find the cost. We're trying, we have an equal cost. Well, what is our x? So what's the number of copies that gets us to have them equal? So now we get to start solving. Let me get this out of the way. I can't have two X's on two different sides. They need to be together. I like to move the X first so that I can control the sign on it. I generally like to keep my X positive. So if I move, if I subtracted five cents off this side and this side, it would still leave me with a positive. But if I subtracted 10 cents off this side and 10 cents off this side, it would leave me negative. So I'm gonna move that way. I'm going to take five cents off minus 0 0.05x. If I have a dime, I take a nickel away. I still have a dime. Or uh, I have a nickel. Ugh. All right. So 20 equals, so 55 equals 20 plus 5.05x. Now the x wants to be alone. It's going to kick the 20 out of there. I kick the 20 out, I kick the 20 out, that leaves me with 35, okay? So basically, at, at the difference in rate, I gotta find out how many five cents are in $35. So when I divide 0 0.05 out, that leaves me with X equals 700. So, because my Y's are equal, my cost is the same at 700 copies. Now we could plug that seven in, 700, um, 20 plus 10 times, I just would move the decimal over. This would turn out to be $70. So my combo would be at 700 copies, both places would cost me $90 or cost Elliot $90. Well, we're not trying to find out at what point are they better or are they the same? It asks, how can Elliot determine which plan will be cheaper and so which one he should use? Okay. We don't know Elliot's quantity, how many posters he needs. Maybe this is just a small, teeny, tiny little venue and he definitely does not want too many people there. So he's not gonna you know, be splattering it over an entire giant city. We don't know. So what we wanna do is advise him. If 70 is the tipping point of when they become the same. So if I was graphing this and one starts off at 20 and then at 10 cents per copy, it goes it's there. The other starts at 55, but then because it's a cheaper slope, it doesn't grow quite as quickly. And I see that they meet. Okay, this is a graph expressing this story problem. So if Elliot, this is A plus, print more. So we could advise Elliot, if, you, if he is printing less than 700, A plus is cheaper because it had a smaller startup fee. But if he has to print more than 700, the print more becomes better because it is at a cheaper per copy rate. So that's what you have to determine. So as we saw, we've already covered that graphing and substitution are two different methods of solving systems. Graphing is great when it's easier to put in slope intercept form and graph and have the lines intersect evenly, small numbers. 
Substitution method is great when you already have a variable that doesn't have a number on it. So it's easy to isolate as a Y equal statement or an X equal statement. Sometimes you have numbers on everything and then trying to use one method, the, the earlier two methods, isn't going to be your most effective option. So that's why we have the elimination method. If I have a 2x minus 3 equal, oh, 3, sorry, 3y three equaling 0 and a negative 4x plus 3y equaling negative 1. In these situations, we basically are kind of setting it up like place values. This is these X's are one place value, the Y's are one place value, the constants are another place value in their own space. So we're putting them over one another. And then what we're actually doing is combining them. And when we do that, we want to do it in a way that lets us eliminate one of our variables, which means we have to have the inverse of the same number on one of our variables. It needs to be the same digit with one being positive and one being negative so that when I combine them, they turn into zero. In this situation, I have that with the Y. I have a negative three and a positive three. So that when I combine them, I have a zero Y. So two and negative four gives me a negative two X. These go away. You can plug in a zero if you want. Um, I generally just put a slash through it. And then zero and negative one adds up to negative one. So now my last step is, well, let's find out what X is. To do that, I divide negative two off of both sides. Divide negative two, divide negative two. So then I have X equaling, well, I can't reduce one half by anything, but a negative divided by a negative turns it into positive. So X is one half. Now that I know what X is worth, I plug that value into either one of my equations. It doesn't matter which, because we're finding the value of Y that's true in both of them. So it's going to work no matter which one we choose. I'm going to go here because I think that seems really easy. If I have two, one half of a time, minus three Y equaling zero, well, half of two is one minus three Y equals zero. I need the Y term by itself. So I need to subtract one, subtract one. So I now have negative three Y equals negative one. Almost there. <laughs> okay. So then we got to get the Y by itself, which means we divide the negative three off of there. Divide negative three. Divide negative three. The negative threes cancel out, leaving me with a Y. I can't reduce oh, negative one third by anything, but I can take the negatives off because a double negative leads to a positive. So I, it's, this is showing that my solution is one half and one third. Okay, there's no way you could find that if you were hand graphing it because this is such a weird spot on your graph. This is why the linear function method or the graphing method would be a terrible way to solve this. And I mean, the substitution method could get us there, but it's so, I mean, look at, it just let us cancel out one of the variables. We didn't have to do anything. Isn't that nice? That's what the elimination method is for. Okay, so we still need to verify. We know that this combination worked in our first equation because this is the one that we plugged in our X to to solve for Y. To make sure that it is truly the solution to the system, it has to also work in the second equation. So we got to apply it. And don't freak out just because you see fractions, it's not the end of the world. All right, so I have a negative four times X's value, which is one half plus three, oops, not a two, a three times Y's value, which was one third, and it's supposed to equal a negative one. Well, let's double check that. What is half of negative four? It's a negative two. What is one third of three? Turns into one. Okay, because uh, if you put three over the one, cross cancel, all you're left with is ones. So you have a one. 
If I have negative two plus one, what does that leave me with? It leaves me with a negative one. So one half and one third is the solution to my system. So again, this is the best method. Uh, elimination is the best for solving this because I have all of these numbers on front of my, in front of my variables. And so that's not gonna be the easiest to rewrite using the substitution method. Now, to solve for with the elimination method, we have to make sure we have the same digit, but inverse. So we need a positive and negative number. If I look at this, five and two are different, they have a common, they would have a common factor of 10, but here three and six are similar because I'm like, oh, those are both values related to three, but they're not the same. So what we have to do is we have to modify equations sometimes in order to get that elimination possibility. I can turn a three into a six. How do I do that? I multiply it by a two. But what I do to that three, I have to do to all values inside of that. So I'm keeping my proportion the same. The other thing I notice is both of them are negative. So if I just multiply by a two, I'm gonna have a negative six S here. Well, six, negative six and negative six does not cancel out. It leaves me with negative 12. So I'm not getting rid of a variable. So that means, I need to make this a negative two so that this negative three can turn into a positive six. So then I distribute the negative two, negative two times five is gonna be negative 10 R. Negative two times negative three S is gonna be positive six S. And negative two times 19 is going to be negative 38. Okay, now my system has the S's of able to cancel out when I combine my equations. My S's go away. I'm just going to cross that out. And if I have a negative 10 and a positive 2, that simplifies to a negative 8, equaling a negative 2 and a negative 38, same sign. So I get to add them together and keep their value because it, the, the negative does not go away because I'm not multiplying them, I'm just adding them together. If I owe 38 and I owe two, it means I owe 40. Now I have a negative eight R equaling a negative 40. I can divide the negative eight off of both sides, leaving me with R equals a negative times divided by a negative is a positive, so that's nice and 40 divided by eight is five. So based on my calculations, the R should be worth five. Now I gotta find out which one is what the value for S is. I can go back up to my original first equation. I can go to my second equation or I can go to my modified first equation. It doesn't matter because they're all points on the exact same lines. It all works, okay? I'm gonna go with the small equation though where I have a two times R, which is five minus six S equaling negative two. Well, two times five gives me 10 minus six S equaling negative two. When I take 10 away from both sides so that the S term is by itself, I get negative six S equals negative two and negative 10 combined to make negative 12. Now I divide the negative six off of both sides to leave me with S equals positive two because a negative divided by a negative is a positive, 12 divided by six is two. So I'm getting a solution of five and two for my equation. But let's make sure because it might be true. We know it's going to be true for this equation because it, that's the value we got it from. It has to work for our other ones as well. So I'm just going to go back up to this original equation, this original first one, and go five times r, and r is going to be five, minus three times s, and s is two, and it's supposed to equal 19. Well, Five times five is 25. 
And negative three times two is negative six. If I have 25 minus six, do I have 19? I do. So that is my equation. As always in the elimination method, we need to make sure that we have a setup where one of our variables has the same inverse number, where one is positive and one is negative, but they both have the same leading digit. Well, in the last one, we were able to just multiply the three to turn it into a six and not do anything to the second equation. Well, I can't multiply five by something to turn it into a three or three by something to turn it into a five. When I look over at the Y, I can't multiply three by something to turn it into a four or vice versa. So that means I have to modify both equations in order to get the same leading term or the same leading uh, integer. Now, it does not matter if we focus on getting the same inverse for X or if it's for the Y, it's your choice. I generally like to just go ahead and get rid of the leading digit, the leading variable so that I have, I'm solving for Y and going from there. So if I'm looking at five and three, the first multiple that they both become is 15. So that means I'm going to multiply this top equation by three so that I can turn that five into a 15. And this bottom equation needs to be multiplied by a five to turn the three into a 15. But if I just do that, I would then have a 15 X and a 15 X. Those do not cancel out. So one of these has to be negative. I'm going to go ahead and just choose the bottom one to make it negative so that I feel like I have a positive number and I'm subtracting something from it. It's just my own thing, but it doesn't matter which one you choose. So I'm going to make this be a negative five. So now I need to rewrite my new equations. Three times five X is going to give me 15 X. Three times three is nine Y and 25 three times is going to be 75. Okay. Now I go to the second equation negative 5 times positive 3x is going to be negative 15x. Negative 5 times positive 4y is going to be a negative 20y. And negative 5 times 26, I should have gotten a calculator out ahead of time. Because I'm not going to try to mental map it or work it out by hand. 26 times 5 gives us 130. Okay. So this gives us a negative 130. Oh, maybe I should have picked the top one as my negative. Oh, well, it, it all works out the same. Okay. So now I have a positive and negative of the same number. Those cancel out. X is gone, it's been eliminated. But if I have a negative nine and a or positive nine, negative 20, the difference is a negative 11 Y. Now I need to find the difference between 130 and 75. Let's get that calculator out again because I just don't trust myself. 130 minus 75 leaves us with 55. And that is a negative, negative 55. Oh, well, that works out because I know I need to have double digit number in order to be divisible by 11. So when I divide both sides by the negative 11, I get y equals 5. That's not too painful of a number. Okay, so now we can plug it in. And which equation we plug it into is limitless almost. We can plug it into the first original equation, the second original equation, the first modified equation, or the second modified equation. It doesn't matter because these are still the same lines. And this is still supposed to be the same solution where these two lines would cross if I was graphing them. It's up to you. Uh, I'm going to just go ahead and go here. So why? The other thing is make sure you know which variable you've just solved for and you're plugging it into the right spot. Can't tell you how many times I'm like, oh, it's five, and I plug it into the wrong variable. You won't work out if you do that, okay? Uh, so we have a 5x plus 3 times y, and y is 5, equaling 25. So if I have 5x plus 15 equaling 25, I take 15 off, 
to be able to get the x term by itself, leaving me with 5x equals 10. I divide 5 off both sides, be x equals 2. All right. So if I did this right, my solution should be 2 and 5. I need to make sure I did it right by verifying it with the other equation. All right, so we'll plug in our X and Y values. X is two, three times two plus four times five is supposed to equal 26. Three times two is six, four times five is 20. Yes, that adds up to 26. So this is a true ordered pair solution for both of my equations. And there you go.